Hello everyone and welcome to another video for Programming for Data Analytics 2. So in the last video, we covered principal component analysis and uh, other than going over the math, I showed you how to do everything in Python. But there's one big thing that I forgot to show you and I wanted to just make sure we didn't miss it. So I made this sort of addendum video for that. Uh, and that is looking at the loading scores, right? So one of the big things that uh, you do with principal component analysis is the dimensionality reduction aspect, right? And the way you know that a principal component is actually useful and, and that the graph, the, the reduced graph like is, is useful is that did, did you see that there's a high variation within that principal component one? But once you know that and you're like, okay, that means that this is a good like 2D representation of my 20,000 dimension data. Uh, then you actually want to know what of the features made up the recipe to make that principal component, right? So if you have something from five dimensions, so five features, and you make two principal components, PC1 and PC2, and you see that the variation of principal component one is like 92%, you're like, great. So PC1 really represents my data just in one single variable, right? Okay, cool. What makes up that variable, right? What is the combination of my original variables, my original five features? What combination of that actually makes this variable? And of course, when you look at those, you wanna find out which of those are the highest score because that means that that's the most like important variable, right? That's the one you wanna keep for your machine learning and throw away the ones that are like really low percentage because those are just noise, can mess up things like add overfitting to your data and just make your training slower, right? So you go in, you run your principal component analysis, you come up with a really high variation, you know that PC1's got what it takes to give you that, and now you wanna see in Python, what are the features that it made? And so how do you do that? Well, I, I, for, I forgot to show it to you. I forgot to show you that, that uh, function. It's very mm -hmm. easy. It's, it's basically just one line of code, but it, it's kind of important. So let's take a moment to just kind of uh, show you what that is. Okay. So here we have the examples from the last video. I'm going to show you how to do this in both the Iris data set one and the crypto one. So the Iris data set, let's just run this again. Make sure that it still works and everything. And as you can see, we still have our PCA. Now this is this is three components, PC1, PC2, PC3. We know that the explained variance is 99%, but actually if it's, it's like almost 92%, I think for just PC1, right? We can see that in our results here. Uh, PC1 is 92%, right? So the variance from PC1 is like the meat of it. So we wanna know what makes up PC1? By the way, while we're at this, if you saw the last video, I was complaining that I don't like how big these circles are. So I went in and Googled and I found out how to actually make them smaller. So I'm gonna, you know, addendum that as well in the video. So let's do that really quickly. So uh, it turns out that you can just call a function. There's a lot of ways that you can change it. They're called markers. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with them, different colors, different sizes, like it's really customizable. You're more than welcome to check that out on your own time. But I really just want to show you what really bothered me was with like really big circles there. So it turns out that all you got to do is called update on the figure that you that you drew. So this is, if you remember, this makes a figure, right? And so that you're passing in the data that you're trying to graph. And so what you do is you call update traces. And so you're going to do that before you do the show, but after you make the figure. There are also parameters you could add when you're making a figure to define these things. But like I said, this is more like a quick fix uh, rather than like an in-depth customization of the actual points. So all you do here is you say marker equals, and uh, it's, it's a dictionary. So you need to pass in the key of what you're trying to modify within those markers, which in this case is the size. And then you pass in the size that you want. So, I don't know what the default is, but I think it's like around 12. So like if I pass 12, this should look about the same. Let's try, let's try 12. Uh, 
Oh, so that's even bigger slightly. So I think the default is maybe like eight then. So this is the default. So actually, here, let's do it this way. So let's leave it like that. And then if I do it like this, I might be able to see like a before and after. So show the original one and then show size eight. So let's just see, compare. I think that'll call maybe twice the show function. Okay, so yeah, it, it, these two are identical. I think that's because size eight is the default. So now that we know that that's the default, let's bring that down to like maybe uh, four or three actually. Let's run it again. So just one line of code, easy change. You don't have to remember this. Just write it down somewhere. Reference this video whenever you're wanting to change that if you don't remember. And there you go. Look at that. So before and after. Look how much easier and nicer that is. Of course, it depends on your data, right? But so this is just kind of like icing on the cake. But yeah, that this looks way nicer. And this is size three, so I could even go smaller to size one. Uh, or bigger if I, you know, I want it smaller than this, but bigger than this. So yeah, it's just a matter of putting in a number there. So I thought I, you know, since, uh, since I was gonna redo this extra video, I thought might as well look that up and show you. But anyways, going back to the focus of the video, uh, let's actually show you the loading score. So right now, these are our, uh, our, our variances for each component. So PC1, PC2, PC3. These are our singular values, right? So remember eigenvalues, square root of the eigenvalue, if it exists, uh, would be what the singular value is. So this is singular value one, singular value two, singular value three. And uh, now let's show the loading scores. So how do we get the loading scores? The loading scores, all you gotta do, I'm gonna make them look pretty, but here let's just show you the quick and dirty way. Uh, all you gotta do is call PCA dot and then components. It's literally the top one. Okay, and that's it. I'll make them look pretty, but let's just run it like that initially. Oh, I should I should comment out the graphing of the figures, otherwise it's gonna take me like two hours for this to load now. So yeah, it's, it's not very pretty and whatnot. And here we go. These are actually your loading scores. Now, it doesn't look too pretty like this, uh, but these are the actual values. Now you're like, whoa, that's that's a lot of numbers. That's because this is for PC1, this is for PC2, this is for PC3, and then this is feature one of PC1. So variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four. If you know that, you know, if you memorize that, then, then you can just look at this quickly and be like, okay, I understand it. But if you want to make the data a little bit easier, like just kind of like how we kind of memorize it, that's how these work. But if you want to make this easier to see, uh, then all you got to do is just format it a little bit. And we'll do that in a second. But yeah, this is the loading scores right here. So this feature is basic. And by the way, think, think that some of them are going to be negative and some positive. Just absolute value them in your head. Uh, or, you know, add that in as a, as a line of code. Uh, and basically, look at the higher the number, the more... Uh, the, the more importance that that variable is. So, so for example, here we see an 85. That's really high. This variable is the most important of all the four variables that is actually defining our, PC, our, our principal component. That means that's the one we want to keep for the machine learning to work. Then we see that the next two are kind of tied at 35 and 36. So that's, uh, that's also saying they're important, but you know, if you had to pick between one or the other, well, you pick the one that's bigger, 36 is bigger than 35, but it's really close. So it wouldn't make that big of a difference. However, the one you can totally discard and because it's really just adding a little bit of noise and not really improving your variation much is this one, okay? But like I said, you know, which is which? Well, you gotta know which way you fed in the data, right? So how did you feed in the data? Well. Sepal length, sepal width, pedal length, and pedal width. So the first one, sepal length, so that's probably sepal length. So it means that the sepal width is the one that's kind of useless uh, for principal component one. Do notice that for principal component two, that's kind of like the one that's most important, right? And you're like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, sure. But remember, PC1 accounts for 92% of the variation. That's big. PC2 only accounts for 5%. So within the 5%, it's 72 of that. So it's like the example I gave on the previous video was like you have two people telling you what's going to be on a test. One of them says PCA is going to be in the test. The other one says neural networks is going to be in the test. But 
the first person's reliability of being like of not lying to you is 92%, and the other one's reliability is 5%. So who do you trust? We trust the one with the 92% reliability, right? So that's like this. So PC1 is that reliable person. So you trust that he says that the most important variables are the ones that it says. And then this one with only 5%, it's like, yeah, it's saying this was the most reliable, eh, not really, because it's 5%, right? So just, just kind of a little metaphor there or simile, okay? Anyways, uh, if you want to format this nicer, uh, all you gotta do is uh, just uh, put, you know, put it on a data frame and sort in the variable and then label it. So you could say something like loading score, uh, data frame, and then actually put in the results of PDA components. Let's comment this one out now. And then uh, uh, transform them, label the columns. So I think you gotta pass in the list as the columns. So PC1, PC2, and PC3, right? Because we got three of them. Okay, uh, let's do the index and then let's copy over these labels. And that's it. Go ahead and print that variable out. It's going to take a while because it's going to load the images and then comment them out. That's okay. Just let it do its thing. Oh, snap. Um, oh, I don't have uh, pandas in here. Okay, that's okay. We can fix that. Wait, wait, load scores. Uh, import pandas as pd. Okay, so there's our figure. And there you go. That looks much, much nicer. We could have done the same thing, by the way, with these ones. But yeah. So we got CPO lengths, PC, so we got the PC1, the PC2, and the PC3. You can see how the CPO width is like the, the one that doesn't really make much difference, doesn't help you to differentiate your three classes. Whereas the pedo length is like huge. And then second to that, you got a tie, but still close victory for CPO length and then pedal width, okay? So I guess if you have to pick between keeping the pedals or keeping the sepals, I, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right, then you totally keep the pedals, right? Because like that's pretty good. But technically the best best is the pedal and the pedal length and the sepal length. So yeah. Um, interestingly enough, PC3 is uh, just kind of everything is tied except for pedal length, which is the most important one. So, yeah. But anyways, that's pretty much what you do. So I wanted to, you know, do that. So now let's just go ahead and uh, do the same thing for uh, for the uh, for the crypto one. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and just like copy and paste. So I'm gonna save that. So this is going to be our uh, crypto example. So if you want, we could rerun it before we touch it. And yeah, look at that. Oh, we should probably change that too while we're at it. But yeah, there's that. This one's the, uh, I don't think this one's the normalized one or is it? No, it is a normalized one because the, norm the non-normalized one was like a line. So yeah, um, first thing is then actually let's go ahead and change the markers while we're at it for figure two. Okay, so that'll fix that issue. And then let's go ahead and show the loading scores. So PC1, PC2, the index here is not going to be these. We need to pass in the right columns and that is currently stored in BTC ETH DF columns, right? Uh, we do remove the date column. So that should stay there. So yeah, that's fine. So yeah, we just got to call that. That's easy, even easier than the other one. And then just print the loading scores out. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's really it.
first, let's see just how much more beautiful that graph is going to look now. I'm actually excited to see that. Look at that. Actually, it's still big. I want to make it even smaller. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with one. See how small that gets. That might be too small. Let's go with just two. But still looks already nicer. Uh, but more importantly, let's look at the principal component stuff. So you can see here PC1, PC2, and PC3. And by the way, if you wanted to make this even nicer, like product, you could sort them by size. Like take the absolute value of them and then sort that. And then that way you could easily see which one's the top one. Because right now I had to look through them. And if you have like a thousand different variables or features, then you don't want to look at them by hand. You should just call sort on that. So that's easy to do, you just literally sort them. But make sure when you sort them, you sort them after their, after their length. Don't try to sort this and then label it because otherwise your labels are gonna be all messed up, right? So first of all, we saw that the uh, PC1 accounts for 87% of the normalized one. So that's pretty big, right? That's good. And then of that, let's take a look at PC1. So for example, the change percentage is really a useless feature, which is not surprising. Uh, the volume one is only 4%. Again, ignore the, the negatives. Just take absolute value of it in your head. So 4%. So that's really telling us that the, the look, analyzing the volume trade of the day, so how much ETH is bought and sold, isn't really good at telling us much about whether the price is going up or down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I thought it would be, well, I mean, I know that when there's high volume is because there's like a crash, uh, people panic, panic selling or buying news. There could also be, I guess, a rise, but there's definitely big swings when there's volume changes. I mean, when there's high volume in the more of a chill day, the volume is pretty, pretty standard. So interesting. But I mean, again, those days are, are few, right? Like when there's like flash crash or flash rise of things. Those don't happen a lot. And we're feeding in like, I think it's like over a thousand points of data. So of course it's only five or six of those, even though it's a really good indicator for those five or six points, for the rest of them, it's pretty useless. So that's probably why this is telling us low, but it doesn't tell us the full story as you can see in a way. Um, what is telling us the full story? Uh, no surprise here. The highest indicators are the ones that we're actually were using before which is the, uh, the, high, the, the, the closing price and the opening price. So the opening price and the closing price are the highest indicators. So those are the ones that are as effective as telling us uh, what is happening with the data set. So yeah, that's probably, that's, probably, that's probably a good thing. That means that we did use the right features. Although I also see the high here. That's interesting too. So maybe we should be feeding the high as well to the uh, machine learning model, and maybe that'll improve it a little bit. Uh, also the low, you can see that's pretty high too. I mean, in the order of, the, this is almost like, almost sorted actually, because it's, it's going down like this. I mean, technically, the, technically, it's interesting. The high is a better indicator than the price in general, like by very little, but it's still slightly. So we should definitely be throwing in the high. We should also throw in the low. Which other ones should we throw? Well, the opening price and, and, and the, uh, of, 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 of Ethereum and the closing price, which of course would give us the answer. I mean, if we threw that in, that would give us the answer, but, but still, uh, interesting. So yeah, so this kind of tells you some very useful information. And as you can see, it's important to be able to see this. That's one of the big reasons why you do PCA. So sorry for not showing it last time. I guess when you go in three hours long, you start to forget some things. Um, so yeah, that's really the main purpose of the video. Uh, while I'm at it, since uh, we're only 19 minutes in, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, one of the questions that came up by someone else was uh, talking about uh, confusion matrices for multi-class classification, right? So when we do multi-class classification, we're not just doing binary classification, we could be grouping things into three or more, such as the iris data set, which has three classes, right? Three types of flowers. And so when you're trying to look at the metrics of that, things like true positives and false positives, when you're looking at binary, it's as simple as saying a true positive or a false positive, right? But when you're looking at multi-classes, what does that mean? Well, you have to compare 
one versus the two other classes or one versus the 10 other classes. So your confusion matrix is basically going to be, uh, it's going to be a square by, and the number of rows and columns is going to be the number of classes. So with binary, you have two rows and two columns. So you have the four that we know and love. Uh, but when you go to three classes, you'd have a three by three. If you had 10 classes, you'd have a 10 by 10. So how do you actually read it and how do you get that printed in Python? So let me show you that really fast and let me show you how to read it so you better you can better understand it. So here we have the areas that the iris data set one. Let's just run that one, see if it still works. Uh, here you go. So this is the one where we're doing uh, linear regression on it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, I'm going to take the metrics from the the uh, crypto example that shows all the confusion matrices and whatnot. So that's not this one. That would be uh, this. Where is it? This one. So we know these metrics give us a confusion matrix for a. In fact, here let's run it really fast. So. Here we got our true positives, false positives, and all that. And here's our confusion matrix. It's a two by two because it's a binary classification. And so I'm going to take that code and I'm going to modify it to uh, generate the confusion matrix for a multi-class classification example. Okay, so copy, paste, metrics. So I'm gonna import metrics. Uh, this one's called log reg. There's no R at the end of it. Yep, so we have to just change these variables here. Also, we're not storing the prediction results. So let's quickly call, uh, store those. So I'm gonna create white predict, and I'm gonna say log reg dot predict, and then feed it in the test set. Right, so there we go. There's a test. We can see the accuracy of the train. The test, yeah, all this stuff can stay. Uh, we don't need this overall score, so I can get rid of that. Um, and uh, okay, so yeah, so you, it's the same way that you would do for a binary classification example. You just uh, call precision recall escort to see those and then call confusion matrix and feed it in your test versus your predicted. So predicted is what the algorithm spits out. Test is what you expect it to get. You could also do this with the training data set as well. I'm doing it with the test one. Uh, and yeah, let's just run it. See, see what that looks like. Okay. So we can see here that we have on the training data set an accuracy of 80%, whereas we have an accuracy of 90% with the test set. That's interesting. Uh, just It's just probably luck at this point. Usually the training is higher than the test uh, or about the same, um, but that's okay. I mean, this is a, it's pretty small. It's only 30 samples that we're doing on the test one. And so of those 30 samples, you can see the confusion matrix for it. So you can see now it's a three by three. So the question is, how do you actually read that? Okay, don't fret, it's pretty easy to read it. So let me copy it over here and just show you. So we have the following numbers. We have a 10, we have a zero, and a zero, and then we have zero, seven, two, zero, one, ten. 10. Okay, and this is that matrix. So it's, because it's a matrix, Python, you see the squares, because it's like a 2D list per se. So uh, the way you read this is, for, first of all, ignore those brackets, and then the top ones are the predicted values for class. And these ones are the expected values, or like the actual values, so the truth, you can, the ground truth per se. I can't write sideways. Actual values. Hey, I did a decent job. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so basically, though, if you look at it vertically, what you're looking at is what it should be getting, and then the actual one is what you actually got out of it. 
So for example, this one, what does that mean for this? That means that, and, and well, first of all, think of this like a class one, class two, class three, and then think of these also as class ones, two and three. So class one, class two, and class three. So what are these classes? Well, it's the iris, it is, so it's the flowers, right? So that would be uh, whatever the whatever the order is that it's that we fed it in originally, which um, we uh, we're printing it up here. So we got to scroll up all the way. So Toza, Versicolor, and Virginica. So I'm just gonna write that down. So Toza. Versicolor and Virginica. Okay, so there we are. So basically, what the blue one indicates is we predicted class one, and the actual value is class one. So that's a this like a true positive in the sense, but you don't think of it like true positive because then you got like half true positive, I suppose. Okay, but uh, yeah, so this is what we want because this is good. That means we predicted the right class. Similarly here, this is also like a true positive in the sense that we predicted the right class. So we predicted class two and the actual class was class two. Similarly here, so all the diagonals are always gonna be what you wanna get. So we are predicting what it should have been. Okay, so that means we predicted the Virginica and it actually was the Virginica flower. Okay, so now what happens, for example, in this case here, this two? That means that we actually predicted uh, class three. So we were predicting class three, but it actually turned out to be class two. So it's a mistake, right? So let me write it down here. So this means we predicted class three and it was actually class two. So it's a mistake. You don't call it a false positive or you know, false negative because there's three level, three classes, right? So there, it's, it's more complicated than that. Those terms are only useful when it's like binary. But you know what it means. Like if that number is really high, it means that we keep like essentially thinking it's class three when it's like actually class two. So maybe we should figure out what's happening with that, right? So by that logic, uh, if we look at say something like this error, oh, let me try, uh, let's try this one. Yes, yeah, so this error, did we not get any other errors other than that? That's actually pretty neat. Yeah, we didn't get any other errors. Oh yeah. So if we look at this error, what this error means is that we predicted class two, but it was actually class three. So it's kind of like the opposite of the error of the other one. So our model. predicted class two, but the correct answer was class three. So hopefully that makes sense and you see the pattern there, okay? Uh, just to complete it, this one would mean that we predicted class one, but it was actually class three. In fact, this means that all of these tests should have been class threes and our model predicted class three correctly here, predicted class two incorrectly here, would have predicted class one incorrectly here if we had any numbers here. As you can see, all of these should add up to the number of samples that you fed it in. In our case, it was 30 of them. And as you can see, 10 plus 10 is 20, plus seven is 27, 
plus one is 28, plus two is 30. So there accounts all our test uh, cases. So that's how you read the confusion matrix. And of course you can label it as well. You can modify this if you wanna make it pretty. I'm not really gonna do that right now, but uh, yeah. If you wanted to see this, for example, this confusion matrix for the, uh, the training data set, I believe that's Y train and Y or what's, it, what's that one called? Oh, I guess we haven't actually fed it in. So let's just fed it, feed it in here. So let's do a uh, log regression dot predict X train. So just basically we're predicting for all of the training ones. So here we go. This is what that one looks like. So again, this is, we are predicting class one and it actually was class one, so that's good. So the diagonals are good. You want those to be like all maxed out. Uh, also important is to see that they're balanced, right? If, if it's unbalanced on your training data set, it's gonna bias your model, it's gonna cause problems. Look at imbalanced learning to find that ways of fixing that issue or at least not fixing it, but tackling that issue. As you can see, we have uh, no issue where our model predicted class one when it should have been class one. So for example, if this was not zero, that would have meant our model predicted class one, but it was actually class two. This would have meant that our model predicted again class one, but it was actually class three. So it basically never makes a mistake. Like when it knows it's class one, it knows it's class one. It also never misclassified uh, anything that wasn't class one into class, uh, into like a different class it seems. Uh, which which is why this is zero zero where it's making or having trouble in the training is between classes two and three which makes sense if you look at the uh, if you look at you know when, uh, actually at the principal component analysis look at that that's pretty useful right so yeah if you uh, if I run the principal component analysis again with the pretty picture, you can see classes two and three are these ones. So, so this is Virginica and Versicolor. Class two is Versicolor and class three is Virginica. That's what we had here, see that? So you can see how class one is like pretty solo, which is why the model has no problems training that. But these two, you can see how like this one right here, this one right here, are like on the border of that. So it's not easy to linearly separate that uh, and the principal component, you know, and, and you can just kind of, you can, you can, you can see that from the principal component analysis. So you can see why the, 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 uh, the logistic regression is also having issues with that as well because of those borderline errors. So look how cool it is that we can use principal component analysis and links to our lo logistic regression to understand why our model is performing the way it's performing. That's pretty neat. You couldn't have seen this with the four dimensional data set because you couldn't have graphed that properly. So there's that. And also you could see this ambiguity if we ran the two dimensional uh, principal component analysis that we did as well. I believe that was 19. See, so like this one and this one, are probably the most problematic ones. And then on the green side, maybe like this one and this one and this one and this one. So it's these border areas that are, that are harder to link, to separate. Because I mean, you could super overfit a model that like curves all the way around, but that model is not gonna be very useful for real world applications because like it would, I, I think a much better model would just be something that like draws a line here, literally separates the data this way. Uh, anything else is just going to be overfitting, will work in your test data set or your training data set, but it's not really going to apply to the real world if you were to run it. So, whereas this is just nice. This is like, yep, I am happy here and you could draw the line anywhere here and not run into issues. You definitely don't want to overfit and make some weird squiggly line that just covers all of this because again, that would be overfitting and you would miss general cases. That's why you would order just like a nice little line. So don't overdo it with the polynomial stuff. 
Uh, anyways, going back to the uh, to the confusion matrix, and you can see here, by the way, the the issues that it's having, the training that I said, like that one, that one, that one. So you can see that too here. But uh, yeah, so this one here is going to represent that we're trying to predict class two, but it actually was class three. And this one is that we're trying to predict class three, but it was actually class two. So yeah, that's how you read it. And this would apply to if we had 20 different uh, variables there. So different or 20 different classes, sorry. So yeah, that's how you read a confusion matrix. So hopefully uh, that kind of wraps up principal component analysis and also just in general, uh, you know, the previous algorithms, just things that I wanted to add, which was how to make this little circle smaller to make it more easy to read. And then also how to uh, read confusion matrices for multi-class classification and how to look at those metrics and understand them, okay? If you want to compute precision and recall for the higher dimensions, it's doable. The formulas are more complicated. Uh, you can find online descriptions for that. But again, you, you know, it's pointless to compute things that you're not going to understand. So um, I think confusion matrix is, is, is a good enough thing. Although here you can see uh, where, where that's kind of coming from uh, in, in this here. It, because I believe this is actually giving you precision recall for the multi-class classification. Uh, we have one, two, three, and four. I don't know. What, yeah. So each one is for the uh, for it, it, the way it's thinking. It's like assuming that it's the true would be this class and everything else would false. Then that assumes to be the true positive and false positives, so then they can compute precision that way or recall uh, for each of these. So that's how that's done. But again, this is kind of hard to to consider, to like in, be intuitive about, whereas the confusion matrix is just much much nicer, and you can kind of get a better feel for it that way. So that's why I like the confusion matrix for multi-class classification, and then for binary classification, precision and recall are nicer, uh, and Accuracy is nice for anything, but does not tell the full story. So I'm always extremely cautious when uh, looking at just the accuracy of a model to make a decision on whether it's a good model or not in general. So, yep. All right, then. That's it for the video. So this is a short one. Um, I guess, yep, that concludes the video. So thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. See ya.